wanted to be here. It's been a long day, and this is the last. But I try to be brief and entertaining. And I think it's nice and appropriate that this is close to us. Because every one of us has a dream, an experience, something that we believe is for us paradise. For me, that is standing in a forest, in a pitch dark at night, closing my eyes and listening. And I've been awfully lucky that I've been able not only to make this dream happen, but to also turn it into a profession. People actually pay me to do this. Okay? So, I'm going to tell you a little bit of some of the stuff that we um, have learned. And, um, <laughs> yeah. so no matter where in the world you are, if you live in a city, or you live in a village, or you live in a forest, as dust falls, there is one phenomenon that happens. One of the earlier speakers talked about the long chorus, but I'm going to talk to you about what you will hear if you close your eyes when the sun goes down. I don't know how many of you have tried to do that and ask, who am I hearing? What are they saying? And why are they doing this? So the Dutch chorus, predominantly almost all over the world, belongs to the insects. And in particular, to a particular group of insects, the crickets. Crickets have been singing for almost 300 billion years. That's way, 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 way longer that any of us ever did. And they learned to think that long ago. Okay? Most of us don't think about it. So why are they singing? How do they manage to produce these really loud sounds, these tiny, tiny sounds? Why are they singing? It's very simple. Crickets are singing to attract females. Typically only male crickets sing, and they're calling out loud to get females towards them. They sing by rubbing their wings together. And each species has its own particular song. If I can get someone to play them out to short them. It's a very familiar sound. Please yeah. forget. You can move to the next one. A different song. Against this row of pegs. So every time the cricket closes its wings, the 
that took up a wing, rubbed against this row of pegs, and that's what produces the gravity sound, the series of clicks. But what you hear is not a series of clicks. You hear these beautiful melodious sounds. And the way that those are produced is that the energy then goes out into this resonating structure, the mirror and the harp, which is set into vibration. And it's the energy of that resonance that you actually hear. It's a neat trick, and I'll tell you why it's a neat trick. Because you can only close your wings about, at best, 30 to 50 times per second. How fast can you close them? You cannot set the wing into vibration at such a high frequency. But by having this little row of pipes, what they do is to amplify that frequency hundredfold. So you're moving your wings at 50 times per second, but you're managing to vibrate them and get a sound at 5,000 Okay? So it's a neat trick of frequency amplification using this tiny little device. They not only amplify frequency, they also produce very, very loud sounds. And we've been learning the tricks of this trade in some of the stuff that we've been studying. And producing mathematical models of how they actually achieve the speed. And very recently, we've been able to use some of what we've learned to try and design very, very tiny loudspeakers. So maybe one day in the not too distant future, the loudspeaker that you have in your cell phones is going to get a whole lot smaller, a whole lot better, a whole lot louder, thanks to what we've learned from our friends, which they invented 300 million years ago. Okay? Right. But they go further than that. Yeah. They learn to make amplifiers. Okay? So these little animals called the tree crickets, they're all over Bangalore. Look around you. They're among the the commonest crickets around. And they chew a little hole. You can see that little hole in the leaf, stand in front of it, and vibrate the leaves. <coughs> two to three times, okay? Because they've now changed the radiating surface to be something much, much larger. It's the same principle as taking your speaker and putting it in your boom box. This is their boom box. And again, they invented it 300 million years ago, okay? Um, oh, did I miss a slide? Okay, the larger the leaf, the larger the okay? So, you have a small leaf, you get not so much amplification. And incredibly, the crickets seem to know this. If you give them choices of leaves, they're most likely to make these if you give them large leaves. Oh, they're most likely to make this if you give them large leaves. Somehow, they know the sizes of these leaves. They can measure the sizes of these leaves in complete darkness and use the right ones. We have no clue how they know in the darkness how large it is. But they can actually optimize the amplification that they want to have. So let's ask now, why are they so loud? What's driving these tiny animals to sing so loud? Well, things. So, sorry. Can you play the video? So females like to go towards the south. So you've got this tiny little dot in the center, which is a cricket. And there are two speakers playing on either side of her. This is done outdoors in the field. This speaker on the right is louder. And I hope you can see her moving. This is tiny dot. She's moving and she will move out all the way towards the louder one. So the louder you are and more importantly, if you're louder than your neighbor, then you're going to get the key. So this is a huge pressure on males. You've got to be louder. You've got to not only keep up with your neighbors, you've got to be louder than they are. Okay? And then you're going to get more females. Um, so why do females go for louder males? are either healthier or better or better providers. Okay? In several of these species, the males will actually secrete from their own bodies a nutritious wedding gift for the female. Okay? And when the males 
tend to give them more, bigger males, or how they melt tend to be louder. So it seems to make sense to go towards the loudest. But life isn't simple, you know. As we study crickets more, we realize we can write cricket Mahabharat. Yes? Okay. Because there are other swans and there are cheaters and they're just you. Yeah? Okay. Um, so even if males weren't bigger or giving them better production gifts, being louder is always useful for an interesting reason. It's because of the way they are wired up to localize sounds. So let's step back a moment and ask how do we localize sounds? Have you ever thought about it? If I close your eyes and I play you a sound, you will be able to tell me exactly which direction it comes from. Yes, you will. Try it. We are very good at it. Okay? You can do an experiment with a barn owl or a bat. And they are as good if not better than us at sound localization. But if you think about what is sound and how is it localized, you realize what a feat this is. Sound is mechanical pressure waves. And we receive it with a vibrating eardrum. A vibrating eardrum on its own gives you no clue where a sound is coming from. That's why we have two ears. Okay? So how do you know that a sound is coming from here, here, or here? You know that because a sound from this side will hit this ear very, very slightly earlier than it hits this ear. Okay? Something in the, I think it's something like 200 microseconds difference if it's this side or that. If it's out here, it will hit both your ears at the same time. And if it's in between, it will be some number in between. There's a huge part of your brain that computes these kind of these tiny, tiny, tiny differences in your brain, in bird brains, in bat brains, in crocodile brains, okay? All terrestrial vertebrates employ large parts of their brains to compute these tiny, tiny, tiny differences so they can tell where sounds come from, okay? There's also tiny, tiny differences in intensity between the two ears, and our brains also compute those, okay? But let's look at the poor cricket. I've already explained what's on the slide, so I'm going to move on. Let's look at the poor cricket. Tiny, okay? Two little ears on the legs, hardly half a centimeter between them. There's not going to be much tiny between these. There's not going to be much difference in intensity between these. It's an order of magnitude smaller than the tiny ears. Computing these is going to be much, much harder. And they don't have the machinery to do it. They're tiny. They just have thousands of neurons. We use millions to compute But they find their way. What's the trick? So the trick, the trick really for these guys, and this is just illustrating how bad the problem is, the wavelength of the sound itself is that large. The animal is this tiny. There are very tiny differences. If they had to compute, they would need a supercomputer, right? Which they don't have. But they find their way. How do they do it? Well, they've evolved a smart structure. They have a very, very interesting ear. They have an ear which actually gets inputs not only from the sound coming from the outside, but sound goes through their bodies and migrates the ear from the inside. Okay? It's called a pressure difference ear. This kind of ear, just by virtue of its structure and its geometry, and it's too complicated for me to explain it here, but take my word for it that just by virtue of the way that it is built, <coughs> becomes too much. Meaning, sound comes from this side, the air vibrates a lot more, sound comes from that side, that ear <coughs> So they solve a very difficult computational in a very different way by getting, by evolving a smart tiny structure, which is why people interested in robotics and nanotechnology today are slowly, finally beginning to understand <coughs> that if they start to look at the living world around them, there's plenty that they can learn. And that has spawned a whole new area, an 
area of biomimetics, where people are building tiny directional sound sensors that they can put into small robots, into flying aircraft, or make smarter hearing aids. Why is it more useful to look at insects and crickets? Because they're small, and you want to make things as small as possible, and they don't use computational power. They use smart structures, and that's what we're learning from them. Every insect that we begin to look at, we see a new smart solution to a technological problem. And the world is filled with them. They are thousands. There are thousands of species of different crickets. I'll give you just one example from crickets in sand. But you can think of any number of examples. Light, chemistry, whatever. Insects hold many of the solutions that we are looking for. There are among the most successful organisms on Earth. Among crickets, we've got a diversity of singers. Singers of high pitch, low pitch, noisy, tonal. And they all have their little secrets on how they manage to produce these different kinds of sounds to hear them, to localize them, and to respond to them. And Darwin's endless poems, as we call them, formed over millions of years of evolution, actually formed many of the secrets that today's technology looks for. Although I don't honestly believe that that is the only reason we should study them, or that we should respect them. So I'd like to end with this little uh, thing that I wrote. So the next time a cricket chirp you hear, Remember, they've been around many millions of years. They have so many stories to tell, to listen and learn would serve as well. The tools and tricks of their trade, honed by evolution's relentless pace, have much to teach us if only we would give them our ear and more importantly, their rightful space. <laughs>